This is Jack McDonald. Over the years I've been recording other people. It's often been said, why don't I record my own memories of Rossland for the record? This is November the 11th, 1982, and it sounds like perhaps this is a good place to start since it is Remembrance Day. We used to call it Armistice Day when I was a kid, but now it's Remembrance Day. My earliest recollections of the Armistice Day was actually the first one in 1918, November the 11th, 1918, when the first war was brought to a halt. I would be three years and some months old at that time. We were in Toronto, my mother being a Toronto girl. We had gone back to Toronto to visit her family for about six months, as I recall. I recall we were sitting at the dinner table in Toronto and somebody said, what's that? And then we could hear cheering out on the streets and we looked out and the house across the street, the owners were up on the roof of the veranda nailing up a large flag. I can't remember whether it was a Union Jack or the Red Ensign, but I definitely remember that flag being tacked up on the roof. This was the armistice. I remember later armistice days in Rossland. I recall, and I'm not sure what year it was, I think it would be about 1922 or 23, when cenotaphs were set up in each of the towns and villages across Canada and war mementos were spread around to each of these municipalities. I recall the Rossland one was a captured German army field piece. A field gun with the wooden wheels and uh, typical of the ones you see in pictures of World War I. I can remember going to that cenotaph and as I recall at that time it was at the intersection of Queen Street and Columbia Avenue in Rosslyn. I can remember it was a rainy day, as so many Armistice Days seem to be. And I remember we were in my father's car, my father and mother and my two sisters and I. And we all had flags. I can't quite remember, I suspect they were a mixture of Union Jacks and the Red Ensign. It was an open touring car and I can remember my flag would stick into the hole in the door that was meant to accommodate the icing glass curtains that you put on the doors to close the car in in the inclement weather. I can remember later Armistice Days. I recall at school we always observed the two minutes of silence at 11 o'clock. It wasn't a holiday then. And uh, it was a traditional thing to do. I can remember being at home once. I think I was ill or something. I was out on the porch. Perhaps it was even before I was going to school. And my mother had told me that at 11 o'clock when the city fire bell sounded, the bell sounded the hours of day, it was also the fire bell, but on Armistice Day it rang, I believe, one, one ring at 11 o'clock. And I can remember I obeyed my mother's wishes. I was out on the porch all by myself 
and I kept my two minutes silence and I was a little bit confused by the fact that a carpenter was mending a fence just down below the house and he continued to work through the two minute silence later on Armistice Day became a holiday and ultimately called Remembrance Day. I remember being in high school and it was a holiday as I recall. Either that or it happened to come on a Saturday. And our principal who was a World War I vet had been an army drill sergeant was very insistent that we should go to the armistice ceremony. And of course, subsequent years, the cenotaph in Rosten has been moved several times. It now occupies a spot adjacent to Esling Park, where each November the 11th, people of Rosslyn gather to uh, witness and to remember at 11 o'clock on Armistice Day. I recall now, uh, after listening to this tape, the field piece that had been part of that cenotaph. Uh, the wheels, wooden wheels were burned off it in the big fire in 1929, I guess. Yeah, the 29 fire would have got that because that cenotaph sat on the south side of Columbia Avenue adjacent to the Novak building there and uh, after that the the gun without its wheels wasn't much good for display and it was finally hauled up to the armory and it lay around outside the armory for quite some years ultimately went for scrap I suppose also, the high school principal I referred to was uh, Wesley McKenzie. And uh, that would be around 1929, 1930, 31, that we would be going to those cenotaph ceremonies. One of the things that was uh, unique to Rossland uh, are the sounds of Rosslyn. We used this on one or two of our Golden Nugget radio series, but uh, it's very interesting. <clears throat> when I was uh, growing up in Rosslyn, you, you didn't need a watch or a clock to tell you what time of day it was. You governed your day and your activities by the sounds of the town itself. I can remember lying in bed, one of the first sounds I would hear very early in the morning as the dawn broke would be the crowing of roosters. At that time, uh, chicken coops were quite common within the town itself. And I can remember the sort of answering back and forth of the roosters. The nearest hen house, the rooster would be quite loud and then maybe half a block away, there would be another one, he would be a little bit fainter, and as they went into the distance, you could hear uh, these roosters calling fainter and fainter as they receded across a couple of blocks, but this sort of calling back and forth was a regular thing, first thing in the morning. <coughs> then the mine whistles, of course, uh, punctuated the time of day, the Center Star Mine whistle, of course, was right across the Center, Center Star Gulch from our house, which was the West Kootenai Power and Light Company superintendent's house. And at 5.30 in the morning, the mine whistle would blow three long blasts. This was to wake the miners up and tell them that uh, they'd better get scurrying around and get washed and get their breakfast and get their lunch pails all set in order to be at 
on shift at seven o'clock up on the hill as it was called then at six o'clock there would be two long whistles again this would tell the miners that it was time they were started their breakfast and they had one hour in order to get to work then at seven o'clock when the shift started that there'd be one long blast on the whistle and of course the fellows that didn't make it by then would be late for their shift that day then the next sound of the whistle would be at 12 o'clock and of course we kids in school this is one that we would be waiting for and at 12 o'clock uh, we were let out of school of course to run home and get our lunch because we had an hour's break between 12 <coughs> and 1 then the next one we waited for was the 3.30 p.m. whistle, 3.30 in the afternoon, the mine whistle blew again. This was to mark the end of the day shift. And I always recall this one especially because I had a dog called Mickey, who no matter what he was doing, when he heard that 3.30 whistle, he paid no attention to any of the others, but when he heard that 3.30 whistle, he dropped whatever he was doing and ran over to the top of the sidewalk by our house and looked down the street because he knew that that whistle meant that I would be coming home shortly. So even the dogs paid attention to these sounds of Rossland. The other sounds that punctuated the time of day, of course, uh, were the sounds of the uh, bell in the city hall. I think that bell rang once at seven o'clock in the morning. I can't swear to that now, but I think it did. But I know it rang at noon. And it may have rung 12 times at noon initially, but I think because the bell had a crack in it, I think they just rang it a couple of, of uh, strikes at noon. And of course that accompanied the mine whistle, which also blew at noon. Then at one o'clock the city bell would ring one, which meant that uh, lunch hour was over and everybody would be back on the job again. The next time that city bell would ring would be at six o'clock in the evening and it rang six times to mark the hour of six o'clock. Now as a kid growing up I never knew why we had that six o'clock sound but uh, when I get older and asked a few more questions I realized and found out that that six o'clock bell rang it was the warning to the ladies of the night to get off the streets of Rossland and get back down into their own places of business. In other words, uh, the hookers were not allowed on the streets after six o'clock at night. This, of course, was to protect the young, innocent citizens of Rossland. Then the city bell rang again at nine o'clock at night in the summer and in the winter I believe it was 8.30. But at 9 o'clock on a summer night, that bell rang nine times, and that was the curfew. Any kids found on the street after 9 o'clock would be rounded up by the local policeman and given a severe lecture and sent on their way home. I can well remember being out after 9 o'clock with a group of other youngsters, we were coming from scouts and we were loitering on the way and we were making quite a noise and suddenly out of the shadows loomed the provincial constable and of course we were scared to death. Some of us ran off, but those of us who were too stupid to run off stood there, including myself, and we were given a lecture and told to report at the police station at noon the next day, which we had to do and there was no monkey business. That curfew meant 
what it was supposed to do. Another sound that comes to mind when I'm talking about that curfew, uh, of course, if you were with your parents, there's no problem, but if you were alone on the streets, then you skedaddled off home. But one of the sounds I remember in, in association with that curfew bell is, again, a summertime sound. And the main sidewalks on the main street, Columbia Avenue, were not all concrete at that time. Quite a few of them were boardwalk, and of course, boardwalk planks tend to rattle and bang. And uh, one of the sounds I just remember was hearing the curfew go and then hearing somebody walking along that board rock in front of what is now Mike Delich's store. And it was a very unique sound. It, it echoed back and forth across the street. It was sort of a lonely sound because I think that person was probably the only person walking on the street. I think I was sitting in my father's car at the time. I believe he was in the office for a few minutes, and uh, but it's a sound I just have never forgotten. Now, <clears throat> in addition to the regular time signals of bells and whistles, we also had the railways. Rosslyn, of course, had two railways. The Canadian Pacific Railway came up Trail Creek Valley from Trail on the Columbia River. And the Great Northern Railway came up from Northport through the Patterson Valley into Rosslyn from the other side of town. At about quarter to six in the morning, while these roosters were crowing, the CPR passenger train, which had been sitting at the roundhouse at the railway yards, which were down below us, but only three or four blocks away. The locomotive and the passenger cars would be all coupled up, and at about quarter to six you would hear the steam locomotive begin to back the train up to the station. And of course, being steam locomotives, uh, while the engine was sitting there for that length of time, water would condense in the cylinders, and one of the first things, of course, the engineer would do on a steam locomotive would be to open the cylinder cocks and allow part of the steam that was being entered into the cylinder to blow off into the atmosphere. And this would blow this condensed water out of the cylinders. Uh, if they failed to do this, of course, water being incompressible would probably crack the cylinder head. So. This train would back up very slowly with this <laughs> as the steam blew out of these cylinder cocks. And uh, about halfway back to the station, of course, then the engineer would shut the cylinder cocks off and then you would just hear the regular exhaust of the steam locomotive backing up fairly slowly to the station. Then at 6 o'clock in the morning, the locomotive bell would ring, and then you would hear the locomotive pull the train forward for about 200 yards, and then the engineer would shut off the steam because by that time the train had hit the top of the grade and would coast practically all the way down to trail without any locomotive power. You would hear the bell sounded at the various crossings as they wound their way down through town and uh, then off into the distance. Uh, you would hear the sound of wheels rolling and the hum of the locomotive boiler and all the sounds associated with the train. Now the Great Northern also had a train that went out. I think they went about 8 o'clock in the morning. They left. If you want to go to Spokane, you get on the train at, at the Great Northern Station, which again was just about two blocks down below us. And the Great Northern train would be parked in the railway yard about where the present Rosslyn Secondary School is right now. And about seven o'clock in the morning, you would hear the locomotive 
slowly start to back up. It also had its cars attached to it. They never uncoupled them. The only difference was the Great Northern locomotive had a little different sound to it than the heavier Canadian Pacific engines. The Y for the Great Northern was out at the Black Bear. And uh, the Y was on a flat spot that no longer exists out there, uh, where the present Centennial Park, the ball ground out there, is now. It used to be elevated by about 100 feet. It was uh, a sort of a gravel bank, and uh, the Department of Highways used that in later years for highway paving and removed the gravel bank from the level of the Black Bear Mine right down to the level where the ballpark is right now. But anyway, we would hear this Great Northern train chugging and clanking backwards over the Great Northern trestle, which was right behind the arena, and then it would disappear out of earshot as it went out to the Black Bear. They would Y out there, and then they would push the train all the way back in and we would pick up the sound again as it approached the trestle and they would back into the Great Northern Station in preparation to loading passengers to leave for Spokane via Patterson and Northport and Marcus <coughs> and so forth. Then I believe it was about 8 o'clock that train would then pull out of the station with its bell ringing and head off for Spokane. The Great Northern Line was actually abandoned and removed in 1922, so that was a fairly early sound in my life. But these were regular sounds we heard every morning, and uh, they were sounds that we grew to expect and were part of our daily rhythm. The other sounds, of course, were the church bells. And there were three of them. There was the Catholic Church, the United Church and the Anglican Church. And each bell had its own particular sound. As I recall, the Catholic Church bell, which is the same one that is ringing today, was a fairly deep note. It was a nice bell. And of course it rang fairly early for the early morning masses. The United Church bell which had actually come off the Methodist Church that had been on Washington Street when the Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church in Rosslyn joined to become the, if not the first United Church in Canada, at least the second United Church in Canada before Church Union took place. That bell is also the same bell that's in service today. Then the third bell, the Anglican, Anglican Church bell, which was St. George's Church, the church that was lost to arson here a few years ago and was the Father Pat Memorial Church, had a much higher pitched bell. And of course it was, it rang a little bit faster than the others, but it was, uh, it, it, it was very, it was a very characteristic uh, sound that we, we heard in town. Now, the other bell that we heard, and we always hoped that we wouldn't hear it, it was a bell that tended to strike fear in the hearts, especially of young kids, such as I was at that time, and that was the fire bell. The fire bell was the same city hall bell that rang at the times of days that I just mentioned, but when the fire alarm went in from a fire alarm box anywhere in town, the bell struck a code of numbers. And when you heard that in the middle of the night, you suddenly woke up. There was a, a fear of terror in your heart. And you lay there and you counted. And if it was 15, then we were really scared because that was the firebox closest to us. However, it didn't ring 15 very often. I don't recall any major fires near us other than chimney fires and also one day when one of our West Kootenai barns was struck by lightning. 
But there were major fires in town, and associated with those major fires, of course, was the frightening sound of that fire bell. Now, other sounds that filled the day. We lived right next to the West Kootenai Power and Light Company substation because my father being the general superintendent, we lived in the superintendent's house and the, the substation was oh, 100 feet away from the house. And uh, one of the earliest sounds we would hear in the morning, in those days they had electrolytic lightning arresters on the 60,000 volt line and these lightning arresters had to be charged every day and this was done by closing a rotating switch onto the three phases of the line and this would create a spark and the operator would do this back and forth for maybe a dozen times every morning. It sounded for all the world like the beating of a light stick on a picket fence. But this was a sound that we recognized as being a time of day sound. Other sounds that we heard too up there next to the substation that very few other people would hear were the sounds from the switching towers. In those days switching was done manually the disconnects on the 60 kV line had to be opened and closed and in doing so when they were opened they would pull quite an arc due to the charging current in the long transmission lines and this would be a zap and you, you knew what that was and this arc would follow the switch back for half of its journey and its uh, motion from fully closed to fully open Other sounds that were close by us too from the mines, the big compressor, the big rope drive compressor at the Center Star mine ran continually. I know it ran for two shifts now. Whether it ran on the night shift, I can't recall. I rather think it did. I think it ran 24 hours a day. And it, the big receiver for that compressed air, it was 100 pound compressed air, was again right across the Center Star Gulch from our house. And I can remember lying in bed at night, especially, well, in the summer or the winter, it didn't matter which, and you would hear this boom, 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 of that compressor pumping air into that receiver, hour after hour after hour. And that was sort of like a heartthrob of the community. Other sounds from the mine, of course, were the steam hoist, and the uh, the wheels on top of the uh, head frame over which the hoist ropes passed as they came out of the shaft and went back onto the big drums in the uh, steam hoist which was in a building just on the hillside above the head frame. The steam hoist would start up slowly sort of puff, 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 puff and then would get up to speed and with balanced hoisting it required little energy to keep it going once it was up to speed but as the puffs died out you would hear the rattling of the big uh, guide wheels on top of the head frame you would hear them start to rattle and roll and uh, this would be quite a symphony of sound as the cables rolled over them at quite a fast speed those cages moved up and down in that shaft at a good speed and this, of course, was a very unique sound to a mining town. And, of course, in the daytime, from the hill, as we called it, where the mine was, you would hear the sounds of the blacksmith shop, and you would hear the rivet guns, and you would hear the, the um, electric uh, trams that would haul waste out onto the waste dump and as the men dumped each individual car, they were side dumping cars, you would hear the rock rattle down in the waste dump. And then the side door on the car slammed shut again as the operator pulled it back into its upright position. And then the sort of clickety clack and the hum of the electric locomotive as it rolled its... And uh, 
other sounds up around the mine too, of course, were the ore trains. The ore trains used to go down at least once a day, five or well, at least six days a week, I would say. And uh, the trestle across the gulch to the Center Star Mine was just above our house. We could look up and see it. It was filled in by that time with waste rock, but we still called it a trestle. And the locomotive would line up all these ore cars that had been filled and bring them down and stop on the trestle. Then the caboose, which had been parked up on a siding a little farther up the line on a grade, would then be the brake would be let off the caboose and then it would start to roll and it would roll down and couple on to the back of the train. Then the locomotive would start to pull this heavy load off the trestle and in through the railway cut in behind us. And uh, this would be quite a sound because the locomotive would be pulling fairly hard. This was a big load. And it would pull until it got through that cut and then gradually the engineer would reduce the steam and then the train would be on the severe grade and it would roll down the hill past the yard, the station, and on its way down the trail. And you would hear, of course, the bell ringing and the whistle blowing as it went over the crossings. These ore trains were heavy and they had to be let down the hill very carefully. But these were the industrial sounds, of course, of Rosslyn. Another sound that we always love to hear and we certainly miss now were the wintertime sounds <coughs> of the sleigh bells. During the wintertime, <coughs> when I was a kid, even though trucks and automotive vehicles were used in the summertime, usually they were put up in the wintertime because there was not the snow moving facilities that we have now. And uh, <coughs> the uh, transfer men and the baggage men and the delivery people all went to horses and sleighs in the wintertime. And each team of horses would have its own particular set of sleigh bells that sounded different from any other set of sleigh bells. And as the team walked or jogged along, these bells would ring out their merry sleigh bell song, jingle, jingle, jingle. Other harness bells actually were maybe a group of three bells actually mounted on a trunnion. And these, these would actually ring as the horse, the motion of the horse as he walked along. And all this was music in the wintertime. It was really nice. And it's something that you just don't hear anymore. And uh, you hear songs about sleigh bells, but you just don't hear them anymore but it was something that you always heard in the winter time. And in addition to that, when the snow was frosty, you would hear the crunch of the runners as the uh, runners ran over the, the snow. And it was a sound that was peaceful and just, just made you feel good. In the summertime, too, of course, uh, a lot of the stores, the grocery stores especially, continued to use delivery teams oh, well on, long time before they actually tra changed over to uh, uh, gasoline-driven vehicles because it was handy. The horses all knew practically every stop, and the driver hardly had to tell them when to stop and when to start again, and you would hear the crunch of the wagon wheels rolling on the gravel roads and the horse's hoofs and the clank of the harness. These were all nice sounds. Another sound that was seasonable were the gas-driven single-cylinder wood saws that were in the wood yards. Of course, in those days, everybody burned coal and wood, and uh, trainloads of cordwood, carloads of cordwood would be brought in in four-foot lengths, 
unloaded in the wood yards and then cut on these uh, one cylinder belt driven saws and the sound of the saw cutting through the cordwood was a sound that we heard would start early in the fall and it would go on from time to time all through the winter. This was a very characteristic seasonal sound and it was a nice sound as the saw hit the cordwood at high speed and then gradually slowed down as it got through and then chug 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 and pick up speed again and it was a it was a sound that of course you don't hear anymore these days of course you hear chainsaws but they're they're noisy these saws were musical and were a very pleasant sound to hear there was another thing i forgot to mention about the railway <coughs> sounds <coughs> The CPR passenger train that left at 6 o'clock in the morning went all the way to Nelson and it returned to Rosslyn and arrived in town at quarter to five. And on that train there would be one coach for workmen who worked in the smelter and uh, they would be taken down in the morning. They would get down there by seven o'clock in time to go to work. And then when they got off their 3.30 shift at Tadnack that coach would be waiting there and the train on its way back from Nelson would pick that coach up and then bring it up to Rosslyn and the you knew when the train was coming up the hill because it was a steep grade and you would hear the locomotive exhaust practically all the way from the switchback which is a good five miles down the hill and as this train approached we school kids knew that when that train got to the station uh, it was quarter to five and it was probably time that we should be heading for home. And then that train would discharge its passenger, passengers at the station and then we would hear it back up to the entrance of the yard and then go on up the hill toward the mines to the Y. And the Y was up where we call Railway Street today. It would turn on the Y and then it would drift back down to the railway yards and then back into the yard and would be parked at the roundhouse where it would be serviced by the local engine wiper and ostler. And uh, about quarter to six in the evening when we would be having our dinner we would hear that locomotive bell ring and then we, and we would hear that train back up from the roundhouse to the station, ready to receive its baggage and passengers to leave town at six o'clock. And uh, then at the same time that this six o'clock city bell was ringing to tell the girls of the streets to go to their own establishments, the CPR train locomotive bell would start to ring and the train would pull away from the station and then you would hear it drift off down the hill through town, down past the Union Station in the lower, Union Avenue Station in the lower end of town, then down the hill and off into the distance. That train went as far as Castlegar on the night trip. And at Castlegar, it would wait and meet the Kettle Valley train coming from Vancouver and uh, also on boat night which was three nights a week from Castlegar it would back down to West Robson and exchange passengers and express with the uh, stern wheelers that came down the Arrow Lakes from Arrowhead then that train would return to trail and come up the hill to Rosslyn and it would arrive in Rosslyn at midnight and again, <clears throat> this was a sound we heard in the night. If we happened to wake up, if we didn't, we didn't hear it. But again, you would hear this locomotive chugging its way up the hill for a good 15 or 20 minutes before it got to the station. And it would blast its way all up through town, round through the hospital hill area and making its way up to the station, but never sounding its whistle or ringing its bell. Uh, they would come in as quietly as they could, but uh, there's no way that you can bring a steam locomotive up that hill quietly. 
and that train would arrive at the station at midnight and of course you would hear the sound of the steam driven dynamo that operated the headlight on the locomotive that was a very char characteristic night sound on a steam train plus all the other sounds that a locomotive steam locomotive made and having discharged its passengers then you would hear it back up to the yard entrance and then go up to the Y turn around and then you would hear it drifting back down to the yard again and then you would hear some exhaust noise as it backed up and parked in front of the roundhouse ready to where it would spend the night and then repeat the whole process at six o'clock the following morning on particular occasions such as New Year's these days you hardly hear a sound on New Year's except a little bit of shouting and hollering maybe a car horn honking or something but New Year's Eve was celebrated with a great cacophony of sound in Rosslyn in the early days and I can remember my parents waking me up to hear this and at 12 o'clock everything broke loose the mine whistles blew a steady blast the passenger locomotive in the CPR yard and the freight locomotive if it were there they both blew their whistles rang their bells if there was a great northern locomotive they did the same the three churches all rang their bells and the city hall bell rang as well and there was a great sound for about five minutes the new year really got welcomed in in Rossland uh, in those days in a real a wonderful manner. One other sound that I forgot to mention <coughs> was characteristic of the early days of my childhood. In early Rossland they there were very little indoor plumbing and most of the houses had the outhouse and of course these had to be serviced and uh, this of course was done at night and again if uh, as a kid if you happen to be somewhere or other waking up around 11 or 12 o'clock at night you might hear a team of horses and a rattle of a heavy wagon and then You'd hear the horses stop, then you'd hear foot, uh, foot tramps going uh, across the street, then you would hear rattle, rattle, bang, bang, and then you would hear bump, bump, thump, thump, and uh, then you would hear these uh, footsteps going back across the street again, and thump, thump as the removable section of the outhouse was replaced empty and ready for use and if you happen to get up and look out you would notice this wagon and uh, a man with a uh, coal oil storm lantern to uh, there would be two men actually because they would have to handle this and uh, the, their only light was this uh, storm lantern and of course this this is what we used to call the honey wagon and it was a very necessary part of the city services in those days. However, that is all gone now, and uh, that really is a sound of Rosslyn's past. <laughs>